there seems to be a standing assumption in government that these energy prices are going to fall and that this is just a short-term blip and the scheme announced by the Chancellor last week, that's assuming that prices fall. But what happens if they don't? What happens if they stay at these levels? Or, even worse, what happens if they rise? And that, of course, is Putin's ambition. So I'm delighted now to be joined by the Director of Energy at Net Zero Watch, uh, Dr John Constable, to talk about this issue and what we should be doing about it. Uh, John, a very good morning. Thanks for uh, being with us on Ties Talk. So, Thank you, Richard. Good morning to you. Um, Bill's landing and, frankly, terrifying us all. Uh, the size of the increases, uh, the sort of almost £700, which, of course, is actually not 700 quid. It's Give or take, it's about 1,000 quid pre-tax on someone's salary in order to be able to afford the 700. And uh, you've seen the Chancellor's scheme last week, and you've heard my intro there. I mean, what are your thoughts on how the government's responding to this in terms of the short term? And then let's talk about the medium term solutions. Well, the short term response is simply cowardly. Um, they're not addressing the fundamental problems. Uh, the UK energy policy has been malformed, badly misdirected since the early 2000s. And none of this is a surprise. And none of it is at all surprising. This was predicted in the early 2000s by many other analysts and myself as well. We'd say a renewable system is immensely vulnerable to international gas prices. The only high quality fuel in the system is gas and your security supply is guaranteed by gas. And thus you become extremely vulnerable to fluctuations in gas prices. In addition, of course, the cost of the renewables is very high and it, it takes up all the headroom in the national budget. We're spending about 10 to 11 billion pounds a year subsidizing renewables. So our energy is already very expensive. Then when gas prices rise very sharply, well, obviously you're going to have a crisis and that's exactly what we've now got. So the Chancellor's decision to try to loan money to uh, companies to always to spread the cost over a few years is simply dodging the issue. The fundamental problem is that policies since 2000 have failed and they have to deal with them. What do they need to do? Well, some very drastic things, I'm afraid. And this is the thing, isn't it? Because when the Conservatives took power back in 2010, give or take, we were a net exporter of energy. And of course, now we're a massive Import. net importer. And uh, the figure that's, that sort of sticks with me is that importing gas, whether it's from the Middle East or from Russia, actually the CO2 uh, created and generated for that import is some 60% plus higher than if we used our own gas, for, whether it be shale gas or North Sea gas. Well, this is the deep irony of what's happened to us. And we've made enormous efforts to decarbonise the system. And in fact, we haven't been tremendously successful at it. We would probably be in a better place with regard to climate policy, if we hadn't introduced renewables. In the early 2000s, we'd already cleaned up UK domestic energy consumption with natural gas. Our electricity system is extremely efficient and was heading towards a gas and nuclear system. And then renewables were introduced by the Blair government. And the entire system was distorted and disrupted. And now we have a mess, which we're going to have to un unwind. So this is not actually a choice between an effective climate policy and low cost. We've actually got to redesign our climate policy. I mean, it's perfectly rational to have a climate policy, but it's, our climate policies are not rational. They're not succeeding. They're imposing much too high a burden on the consumers. We're losing people. And, and, and it's interesting, isn't it, that the EU themselves, um, hardly uh, mm -hmm. close friends of mine, I have to be honest, uh, that they've now um, sort of designated gas as a green transition fuel, I think is what they call it, because they recognise uh, the problems that it's causing. Absolutely. I mean, they're not wrong about everything, Richard. I mean, they do understand some things. <laughs> and Germany is determined to remain a major world industrial power. And there are interests in Germany that can see that the renewables agenda is not going to allow them to go on manufacturing high-value products and selling them competitively internationally. We have to recognise that too. I mean, gas is a very good fuel. We should be using more of it. We're on the skid at the moment. We need to steer into that skid um, work towards opening up gas production in the North Sea again, get what we can out of it. Shale gas in the UK, yes, probably a very good idea. Let's see what we can get out of it. But also decluttering our electricity markets. We simply have to get the renewables out, actually. They're thermodynamically, physically incompetent, and they are distorting the market both physically and economically. Well, I mean, I, certainly I've talked last week, and I'm going to be talking, you know, long and hard about shale gas and the new technologies that mean that actually you don't have to frack 
in order to extract shale gas. And I, I view it very much as the treasure that is under our feet. But um, sticking with the renewables, John, because uh, a lot of these wind turbines and things and these renewable subsidies, uh, they have a sort of a lifetime expiry, don't they? Uh, which over the next 10 to 15 years. Yes, that's right. But we can't wait that long. Um, my view is that we need to get that 10 to 11 billion pounds off the national electricity bill now uh, to give immediate relief to people. I mean, this is not just about electricity for households. So the, the impact on households per year from the electricity bill is about 150 pounds, thereabouts. But the total impact is about 400 pounds a year because there's another 250 pounds a year on the cost of living, which comes into the household as commercial interests and industry and commerce pass on their share of the green levies in prices. So there's a £400 a year burden on average on households. It's too much. Oh, so it's, we, it's vast. I mean, so that, vast. that's sort of the indirect cost. Yes. And then in addition to that, you have the fact that by burdening industry and commerce with these costs, of course, way, there's a downward pressure on wages and rates of employment. I mean, there's no upside to this, actually. And it really, so we need to unwind it fast. We can't wait for the expiry of the contracts you mentioned, Richard. We should get on with it straight away. So no. moving them onto tax and then unwinding them completely. I was, exactly. No, I agree that we have got to, we've essentially got to uh, move the cost of the subsidies into general taxation at the moment. And actually, yeah. uh, the thing is, the government's balance sheet is strong enough and robust enough to take the strain. I agree that should be done immediately. I was just interested in how long it is before these, uh, you know, before the actual contracts with these subsidies, uh, they start to expire. Um, of course, the other big question is the future of gas prices. And Mm. With your experience about what's going on in world markets uh, and what Putin's up to with his geopolitical games in Ukraine, what's your sense as to uh, the direction of travel and gas prices and whether or not the Chancellor is being hopelessly optimistic, thinking they may come down? Well, there is plenty of gas in the world, so it's, he's not completely wrong in thinking there's a potential for them to fall. The question is whether you actually make the UK um, weaker by maintaining this extreme exposure to gas for security of supply. Now, yes, gas prices could come down, and we would be in a very good place if we were a good consumer. And that's where we have stable consumption of gas. We had a domestic supply of our own, which we could use so that we could buy internationally when it was advantageous and, and use domestic supply at other times. Um, so we shouldn't bet on gas prices being either low or high. This is a superior fuel. Everybody in the world is going to want to use it. So prices could well be high. So we should aim in the, in the medium term and the longer term for a nuclear component as well. Now, essentially what the UK has at the moment is a fuel diversity problem. We just don't have the fuel diversity that we had in the past. You know, with nuclear, coal, gas in the past, it's an excellent spread. And that, at the moment we have too much emphasis on gas. So in the short term, yeah, we've got to use gas and we'll be we'll stuck with it. In the medium term, longer term, we need a big nuclear component as well. And, and just uh, finishing on that nuclear component, uh, because the government has just recently announced a, I think it's a grant as opposed to an investment, into the, uh, the Rolls-Royce-led small modular reactors that they're developing. Uh, are you a fan of those? And roughly how long do you think they would take to come on stream to actually be producing uh, electricity here in the UK? I'm a fan of nuclear in general. It's an excellent idea. This is a very high-grade energy source, very low entropy, thermodynamically excellent. So we should go for it. Smaller reactors, yes, extremely promising, really interesting. And uh, the Rolls-Royce offering, well, fascinating, important company. Let's see what they can do. But there are lots of other ideas for small reactors as well. So it's not limited just to Rolls-Royce, which are quite big, actually. There are ideas for using much smaller ones, uh, which would generate heat, high-grade heat for industrial processes. And this is really fascinating. So enormous potential in smaller nuclear reactors, not just for electricity. And John, just finally, could those uh, even smaller reactors, could, they, could that happen even faster than the Rolls-Royce ones? Well, that's really an, an interesting question. I mean, a lot of the delay for everybody, Rolls-Royce, everybody, is in regulation. Are we, are we hopelessly over-regulated in nuclear? Yes, probably we are, actually. There's far too much of it. And the Greens have also encouraged this because they know that the more obstacles they put in the way of uh, nuclear development, the longer it will take and the harder it is to get private money to take any interest in this sector. Um, fascinating. John, thank you so much for those thank thoughts. Uh, that was Dr. John Constable, who is the Director of Energy at Net Zero Watch, with his thoughts about improving the diversity of energy sources here in the UK.